Um, welcome, everybody. Um, it's, it's fallen to me to uh, kick things off tonight. Um, what we've got tonight is actually pretty pretty interesting. Um, so we had um, Joel last time talking about a viable system model. And what happened was, I think he's so passionate that he, I think he lost a lot of people along the way. And what we decided to do on based on some of the feedback was to bring Adam in to actually get a, uh, to use his special technique or his special way of actually getting what are really complex ideas across to people so they can actually understand them really well. So I think Adam's got a specific skill with it. So hopefully you're in the right place. Um, okay, so welcome to Systems at Play as well for those who haven't been to Systems at Play before. Uh, welcome to the new members. We've grown quite a bit. We're now at 432 members. We still don't have anybody from Antarctica. So if anybody knows somebody from Antarctica who would like to join us, we'll have all the continents covered then. Uh, 21 countries, probably more than that now, 48 cities at least. So we've got quite a good uh, demographic We're all around the world. Um, why systems at play? Uh, Ali, Dad, Mikhail and myself got really upset with the way that uh, things were happening and seeing all these sort of patterns uh, happening in the places that we work and still work. And we decided, well, let's form a community around actually looking at things which are more systemic in nature uh, and not just reductionist in nature in terms of things that, that, that we were looking at. Because what we saw was a lot of reductionist thinking about things, which is important. Reductionist thinking is important. You need it. But we didn't see enough actually systemic thinking going on, systems thinking. So we started to explore that. And that's how we started to form a community around this, to find like-minded people to have these discussions about things. It became pretty much a passion of ours. Uh, since then, we've definitely done a lot of exploring of viable systems models, uh, critical systems heuristics, systems dynamics as well, uh, and open systems theory, which is uh, the thing we're, we're most uh, enamored with at the moment. It'll probably start to be something else next, next year. <laughs> uh, about Adam. Um, so Adam has been helping um, leaders since 2012 uh, with strategic organizational space in leadership. Uh, he's got 25 years of leadership experience in organizations, uh, trademark work, engaging expertise with a touch of humor. So if you have, if you get a chance to watch about some of Adam's videos, please do. They're 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 both they're they're pretty amazing. Um, and it's still I still I think. One of the dangers about being humorous about things is that you lose the essence. Adam doesn't lose that essence. He does a really good job of blending the two. Um, it brings together vast knowledge of strategic and organizational systems and people models to create insights and understanding. And prior to establishing his consulting practice, he was an executive at RAA and works and saw success of senior leaders in insurance, finance, education, legal industries, both in Australia and in the UK. And he's just a really nice guy as well. So. I hope I hope I've, I've managed to introduce you well there, Adam. I know I was reading the slide. Um, oh, there's more. Uh, his informal qualifications are in more formal in, uh, qualifications are in economics and law. And he's a qualified barrister bar bar and solicitor in South Australia. Okay, didn't know that. Is that true? Yeah. yeah wow. no, no, it's not. I made it up. No, it's not even, okay. <laughs> Uh, he's, he's got a certificate from the Institute of Development and Coaching, providing feedback on telling coaching and leadership maturity framework. Outside of work, he has he's busy with his family uh, and his soccer coordination for his children. Okay, uh, he lives essentially the exact opposite of the life of, life of Jason Bourne. <laughs> That's great. Cool. Thanks, Adam. Um, cool. Access to our videos, so we have to do a little bit of a plug. We've got um, quite a few videos of all the sessions that we've done. Um, Mikhail has kicked off the recordings, I think, of this one as well. I can't actually see if that's on. I'm guessing that it is. Can you check that for me, Ali Dad? Oh. It's on? Cool. Okay. Please make sure you go and visit some of these. We've got things from um, uh, Peter Orton and Trons, who's on the call today as well, I saw. Mike Jackson we had, which was amazing. Uh, we also had uh, Peter Bellinger, and we had a fishbowl with, with all sorts of people um, as well making up a lot of, of the um, other speakers that were part of the the past years that we've been running so lots of things to, to learn from and, and and revisit there for some of us as well um before we begin uh, we will like uh, like like before we're going to record this one and we'll make it public via our youtube channel uh, please stay on mute during the presentation which is what adam's asked for but feel free to put questions into the chat so that we can uh, revisit them when we need to um, if Adam sees something interesting in the chat or, or if something actually comes up, we might we might have uh, in a pause, have time to talk to him about it. 
but really we're going to save most of the Q&A for the end. Okay, any questions before we start? No? Cool. All right. Over to you, Adam. I will stop sharing. No worries. I'll, I'll get mine. Mine will pop up in just a second. Um, it's always an honor to be talking to a group. So thank you very much for having me and for showing up because you could have been doing anything else. So I don't take that lightly that you're here to listen to me. Um, yeah, I've been doing this consulting for um, about 12 years now. Um, I do strategy and then help enable organizations. I don't use any one model. Um, I read lots of them. I listen to the situation and then I like to help my clients sort of see what's going on, whether it's strategy in terms of where they are or whether it's in their organization. The viable systems model though is one that I often find myself drawing up or sort of going through in front of clients. Um, so the way I describe it, um, my level of knowledge, um, there's actually, there's a guitar in the background. I can play the guitar well enough to get the group singing. And I know the organizational models I use well enough that I can get the group to have discussions and find their way to where they need to go. So, so compared to those who are at the last one, there's no way I've got that level of depth of knowledge of it. Like I'm not a classical guitarist, but I can definitely play it well enough so that we can start to use it. And so that's why I thought it might be useful to give a different angle for me to pop up today and just to be able to go through my angle of the viable system model. So that's, that's the idea. So I'll set off on the journey. Um, as we were saying, collecting comment, collecting questions in the chat is how I like to do it because that then in turn lets us go through them again at the end. But if I've said something that's not clear, if it's not so much a discussion point, but more of a, hang on Adam, I didn't understand that. Could you just do it again? Please feel free to interrupt because I'm always trying to judge the right speed. Okay, viable, sift uh, viable systems model, Stafford Beer. So there's the man himself, Stafford Beer, um, born in Putney in London, there on the district line. Um, and he was one of the original, he, he worked in some organizations. He actually was in World War II, was in India for a while, um, part of that. And he, and he ended up working in basically how do systems work. Then he ended up in this field called cybernetics, which became very big through the 50s and through the 60s and developed various models. Um, stay working in this field for long enough and you end up looking like that. So that, that's what Stafford Beer looked like towards the end. He actually, um, I wouldn't say reclusive, but he, he got into sort of some different lifestyles, art and poetry. One of his final books was actually um, about the connecting of all those things together. So officially goes down as a very interesting dude. So that's the work of Stafford Beer. That's what the guy looks like. His name was actually Anthony. His middle name was Stafford and he denounced the name Anthony and he got his brother, whose name was Ian Stafford, to agree to never call himself Stafford. So you kind of know you're dealing with a different character right from the start. Just to show you something that Stafford Beer ended up with, this is the control room in the country Chile for Cybersyn that he put together in 1972 as a way to try to coordinate the work of all the production happening in the country, but in a way that allowed autonomy to occur within the whole country at the same time. So that lasted for two or three years until there was a political takeover and that sort of Went, went apart, but I can't resist the urge to show this because check it out, what a, what a setup. We're talking 1972 sort of technology here. So again, interesting sort of character. Okay, where does this stuff come from? Just to give you some of the sources, um, brain of the firm, heart of the enterprise, diagnosing the system, but they all talk about the same thing. So these, these books all have in them, the viable system um, knowledge. Brain of the Firm talked about viable system overall. Heart of the Enterprise started looking at organizations and diagnosing the system is the how-to book. It's written in kind of a casual fun style. Um, there's like literally drawings in it and that sort of stuff. You might be pleasantly surprised if you bother to have a bit of a read through. Um, it's quite entertaining in a way. So that's the background. Let's jump in and some of you will know this stuff already so I don't dwell on it, but for those that have having an introduction to it. What are we talking about with a viable system? A viable system is one that can be viable. It's a bit of a um, circular definition, but it can survive in a particular sort of environment. There's often the idea to say it can have a separate existence. In other words, it's in the environment, but, you, but it's coherent, it lasts over time. And so therefore a system is viable. What's the viable system model? Um, anatomy is a word that we could use. It's Stafford Beer putting together his idea of this is the anatomy. These are the bits and pieces that you will find whenever we have a system that is viable. 
that's the claim or the proposition that Stafford B is putting forward. Now, this is the part where we say one thing we always know very well, which is the map is not the terrain and all the rest of it. But we always sort of forget that because when you see arguments occurring about the viable system model, as if we're arguing about whether a bridge will stand up or not, we tend to forget it's just a way to help us get ideas. That's all it ever is, because none of this is real in the sense of you cannot open up an organization or a person or any sort of system and see anything I'm about to be talking about. Or you can see uh, the way in which that stuff appears. Unlike physics, where you can build a bridge and you can literally see, is that bridge holding up or is it not? So I don't claim that the viable system model is the correct one. I think it is a way to access system thinking. I think it is a model of how systems can work that's very valid. And I think there are lots of models for how systems work that can be pretty valid. You were mentioning open systems theory before, Dave. This is an example where we can look at an open system. On the other hand, it could also be used as a closed system. So the point I try to make is don't get caught up arguing which type of music is the best type. Just spot that, okay, sometimes this particular type of music is the one that a given group or yourselves need. I think that's the best way to approach that. Diagnosis tool though, very handy because it actually gives a tool to see is what needs to be happening, happening. How do you tell if a system's not viable? Simple, um, either customers aren't happy or the people working in the place aren't happy or the owners aren't happy. Like that's, that's what we mean when we're talking about a system of which organizations are one is not viable. Doesn't feel right, it's not going right. What are we trying to do? A lot of us have heard this expression as well. Requisite variety, requisite mean as required by the nature of things. So basically, if you're a goalkeeper and there's two people coming at you, two players, two attackers, they have two options. They can pass the ball, they can do things. There's a certain amount of variety. If there's three of them, they have more variety. If there's four of them coming at you, they have more variety. There's more chance they can come through your defenses as a goalkeeper. If you wanna be able to defend, you need to have more variety in the ways you can defend to handle it if there's more attackers coming towards you. If you're an organization in an environment with more stuff going on, you need to be able to either have more stuff going on yourself or attenuate or adjust the stuff coming towards you so that you can handle it. So one of the legends of the field, uh, W. Ross Ashby, when the variety of complexity of the environment exceeds the capacity of a system, the environment will dominate or ultimately destroy that system. And Stafford Beer comes along and says, yeah, that's cool. Or we can just say only variety can absorb variety. So the viable system model gives us a way to see whether we do have the variety we need to be able to handle it. So just hold that concept in mind. And another concept to hold in mind, and when we talk about the hierarchy thing later, is the concept of recursion. So when we talk about recursion, I love this. I'm going to read it out to you. The Toronto Recursive History Project of Toronto's Recursive History. This plaque was commemorated on October 10, 2018 to commemorate its own commemoration. Plaques like this are an ascent integral part of the campaign to support more plaques like this one. By reading this plaque, you've made a valuable addition to the number of people who have read this plaque. To this day and up to the end of this sentence, this plaque continues to be read by people like yourself. So you can sort of get an idea of recursion where you'll find the thing inside the thing. Very fancy definition. Here's another version of it. There's a tin. Look at the tin that the person's holding there. You will see the same tin with a person holding the same tin. Keep going in, keep going in. We'll keep finding the same thing. That's recursion. So you can ask yourself, is that a hierarchy? I suggest shrug depends on your definition, but that's the sort of stuff we're talking about when we talk about viable systems model. Another one, fancy drawing. Each branch, if you went zoomed in on it, you would see the whole tree. So that's an idea where you keep seeing the same things. And ironically, no, I know Gear's part of our call here, the coast of Norway is often used as one of the examples of recursion. You can look at the coast of Norway, got a certain shape. You zoom in to a smaller bit. Oh, look at that, same shape. You zoom in again, same shape. You go all the way into a grain of sand, same shape. So that's the concept. So I've banged on about it a bit, but it's an important thing with the Bible system model to realize that you can apply it at any level, right down to the level of an individual human. So we've got recursion, and we've spoken about to absorb variety. I want to address one other thing before I jump into the model itself, and that's, is it old school? to which I put this in front of you. That's the Principia. This is Newton's work. This is the one where he wrote down all the stuff, force equals mass times acceleration. That's in that thing, all that sort of stuff. Does anyone want to come off mute if you don't already know and just have a stab in the dark about what year you think this came out? I'll just be quiet for 10 seconds. Yeah, 
1830. Thank you for putting that out, Rajesh. So the answer we get is 1687. Wow. Now, yeah, it's actually okay. there in the, uh, the text. In the printing. Yeah, 86, I was going to say. And, there uh, you go. CLXXXVII. Oh, look at that. Yeah. Must be right. Well, it's 1,500, 600, 1,650, 1687, 1687, yeah. Right. Brilliant. Imagine if they get the 1687 Super Bowls. That'll be a tough one to put up there, won't it? Super Bowl 1687. So here's the point I like to make. This stuff still works. And we know Einstein came along. We know relativity. We know quantum. But none of us are getting that close to the speed of light. And none of us are getting that close into quarks down at the very microscopic thing. So this stuff still works. And the viable system model is nowhere near as old as this stuff. But just because it's old school doesn't mean it still works. Now, I'm a fan of repackaging old school stuff to make it more accessible to people. I'm into that. I used to be all, they're just repackaging the old stuff. What's the big deal about that? But then I got a bit less immature and realized if it brings common sense stuff forward, it's great. And a lot of the viable system model, it's common sense. But I always just like to present that to people. Um, Shakespeare, about 1545, by the way, if you want another freak out about when things occurred in history, it's always another one I like. All right, so this is as simple as it gets. Stafford Beer is telling this to us. We need to coordinate what we're doing, ensure we're optimizing allocation of resources, check the things are happening as we expected, have a think about what might need to be different in the future, and remember why we're bothering in the first place. And to do this, we need some information. That's my version of the viable system model. And I don't think anyone can really argue against that. You might even shrug and say, geez, that's as common sense as it gets. But that's what it is. And what Beer does is he's given us what he calls five systems that allow us to check whether this stuff's happening. Now, you type viable system model into anything, and you're going to get one of these. And that's why most people's heads explode, which is understandable. I know this back to front, and I can even talk about it because... I almost think, right, you think I'm not going to get this? Watch me try to understand it. But for the more typical human, you just look at that and say, that's going to do my head in. What use is that? And we quickly move on, which is why I like to do it this way. So jumping into the viable systems model. Now, you can look at it like this. Stafford Beer laid out for us the requirements for a viable system. So if we change system for organization, if we feel like the organization's feeling a bit shaky, not quite right, we can use the model to say, right, well, at least one of these requirements isn't happening. Which one is it? And that can then lead us to what we can do about it. Now, when we got together last time, I just love this way of doing it where if you say we've got an environment there and our little circle in the environment, that's us. So that's our system that's existing in its environment. And then check out my PowerPoint skills. We're going to go like this. And now what we have is we've pulled out the circle and I've put it a much bigger and alongside. That's all I've done. Ready, backwards, forward, backwards, forward. So that's all I've done. So now we've got the operation. And then what we're going to say is all systems have some sort of, now I'm going to call it the management function, but our brain straight away now go to management. Okay, that, that's the hierarchy world that we come from. But look at it as the management function of managing the one that makes sure that it's doing what we think it's going to do. And that's what we have. We have ourselves the environment, we've got the operations, and we've got the management of those operations. And Stafford Beer pulls them into those three blocks as a way, remember, none of this is real. It's simply a way to look at it. And there we have it. There's your most basic breakdown for the sake of being able to map it. What do we have next? Okay. What we're going to do is, we're going to say that we're going to take the operations and they get divided into some sort of subsystems. So, and that's what we're going to be calling system one. And if we give it a name, we call it the primary activities of the organization, system one. So, so far, so good. We're going to be breaking down those primary activities one way or another. So those primary activities, they interact with their particular parts of the environment. Can you see how the diagram starts to bend our heads? But if we start just going at it slowly, it can make sense. I'm going to reverse a bit, okay? We've got our primary activities within the organization and they all interact with their own customer groups and do the things that they do. That's it, primary one. System one's the stuff we do. Think about your body. 
system one is going to be heart, lungs, you know, those actual primary activities that keep the show going. Okay. Now we can divide up the primary activities. And this is one of the, the real value adds of the work of Patrick Hoverstadt, who I think is one of the leading people on the planet and lucky enough, a friend and a colleague of mine in terms of this. And he points out that whenever we're dividing up our primary activities, there's really only four ways we do it. We can do it according to function. We can do it according to customer. We can do it according to geography or we do it according to time. So if you're dividing something by function, that's your classic sales operations, that sort of stuff. By customers, when maybe your fundamental division of the organization is retail and commercial, geography is your north, south, and the rest of it. And time can even be which, like you got the day and the night. That one's not as common. The point is, every given system is going to have some way that we divide up our primary activities because we can't all do it all. Making sense? Cool. Okay. Whenever you have subsystems or people going around doing their thing, they're going to be banging into each other and annoying each other and bothering each other. And that's why we need to have an viable system. System two, which is simply coordination. So while all the primary activities are happening, we need some way so they don't make each other angry and get in each other's way because eventually that wastes resources and ultimately can pull the whole thing apart. So again, pretty straightforward. We've got the primary activities that we do and we coordinate them so they can actually do it in a way that is, funnily enough, coordinated. If you're detecting a real lack of genius here, I'm succeeding because the genius is being able to put it together and being able to use it. It's not actually that difficult when we just go through it slowly. Now you'll notice those arrows there, they start to rely on information because the crucial thing about the viable system model is not just having these parts here, but the way information flows between them. So in terms of the primary activities, revenue is your classic one. If people are paying for it, we might be doing it. What do the customers think? Are they enjoying it? In terms of coordination, is other things working the way we expect them to work? Are the things banging into each other? So we've got operations, we're coordinating them. And now what we need to be doing is managing and managing meaning the allocation of resources as needed between the subsystems so we don't use more resources than we need to. So it's the optimizing. You can look at it from that point of view. And again, our brains are naturally gonna to go to management, bosses. That's what the senior people are doing, but that's a choice you're making in your own head. What Stafford B is pointing out is, the system's gonna need some sort of management and that's gonna be there to actually make sure it's clear what we're asking each primary system to do. The resource bargain is the part where we actually have a conversation to say, here's what we need you to do. Can you do it with these resources? And the reporting is the part where we find out whether the things are happening the way they're happening. Now, this is a key point. Why do we do it like this? Because we are trying to create autonomy for the primary activities. That's what sits at the guts of this. Remember back to Ashby idea of we need variety to handle variety. The more autonomy the primary activities can have, the more they can respond to what's in front of them, allowing them to handle the different things that come at them. But if they have the level of autonomy to the point where they're banging into each other, that's not going to work, hence system two. And if we've got things being autonomous where that's not the best allocation of resources across the show, that's not gonna be ideal for the show as well. So we have as much autonomy as possible within the boundaries of it not helping the wider organization. And the idea of having system one, two, and three is to allow that natural tension to occur. So Stafford B is not answering the question of say centralized, decentralized, or anything like that. He's actually setting up the natural tension and saying, we need systems in place. In other words, ways of doing things that allow those things to occur. The resource bargain sits at the key of it. A lot of issues in organizations will appear because there was never a resource bargain struck. It came from the point of view of saying, here you go, do this, good luck to you. It wasn't a genuine resource bargain. I'm gonna keep rolling along because we're gonna be going through all this and having questions at the end. System three with an asterisk is called the monitoring loop. Now this is a, it's a nice one. The monitoring loop exists to do two things. For wherever the reporting information is going, which is telling us are the primary systems doing what we think they're doing, it's to check that the reports are making sense. They do actually reflect reality. The other purpose of the monitoring loop is if there are people doing the primary activity who aren't the same people as doing the management, 
we can build trust to know that the people who are doing the managing things are aware of what's happening in terms of the primary activities and vice versa. So that's the purpose of the monitoring loop. And it's deliberately called three asterisk as a way to say it sits a little bit outside, but it's a necessary aspect. And there's even some pretty direct instructions given in terms of this in the model. The idea is do not try to go across and see everything, deliberately go down um, towards the primary activities from time to time to really be able to understand what's going on. In the case of a collective, that would mean if there are a group of people that also do primary activities and look after things, from time to time, they all look at each other's stuff as well to see what's really occurring. So we've got system one, primary activities, system two, coordinating, system three, delivery management. And if the world never changed, this is all we'd need to do. Progressively optimize and keep it happening and make it more and more effective and use resources better. But we're also gonna have the future. So if you look at the environment, imagine if I could get it to magically slide by in time like that, you would see the future is gonna eventually become today. And so that's where system four comes in and system four is development. That's the consideration of What's the future possibly going to bring? So what do we need to have? And here's the arrows there in terms of delivery in the future. And it's deliberately set up as a circular thing because what we can do in the future depends on what we can do today. And what we're going to do tomorrow depends on what we need for tomorrow. And the things work in a loop. And this is why we're talking about a viable system over time, because we need a system in place that makes sure we're aware of the future and we can adjust the overall operations accordingly so we're still valuable in the future. And that is system four, which is called development. And there's one final system that sits there and that's purpose and policy. And so that's the reason we're doing it in the first place. Um, you could say that if we are going to be doing development and changing the way operations work, what's the lasting purpose or reason that we're doing that for? What's, what's the development for? But Stafford Beer also worked with the concept is the purpose of a system is what it does. You can turn that into an acronym if you want as well. So you can also look at that from the point of view of it turns out the purpose of the system is whatever the system does. So therefore, do we need to develop it to change it? And once again, there's some arrows there as well, because the purpose and policy are going to inform the development and the delivery management. So that's the model. And if you want to talk where does strategy fit in, look at strategy as systems three, four and five combined. It's the combination of what's our purpose, What's the development? What's happening in the future? What can we do now? What might we be able to do in the future? And that's where strategy sits in terms of systems three, four, and five. Okay. Now I pop in those little squares. I'm gonna go back, ready, squares gone, squares popping in. That's to demonstrate that each one of those primary activities is its own viable system. So just like that tin with the woman standing there holding the tin and on the picture of the tin was the same picture again, recursion. So each one of these little circles there, which is a primary activity is in itself, its own viable system with its own five systems. Because within each department, you're gonna have some sort of primary activity divider between areas. Maybe you have the whatever team and that team. Within teams, you might even allocate different roles. So you can sort of see as we go down, those same systems repeat. And if we go even wider, the systems start to repeat in terms of even beyond the organization. So that's why at the end, we put in that little square. Now, remember, if we go back to that one that we had popping up before, you saw all those diagrams and all those lines and all that weird stuff happening in the middle. That's because what they were trying to represent with that diagram was within it, each one's its own little viable system. And that's the point that we're seeing there. So they are the requirements for a viable system. If those five systems are present, we have, and the information is flowing, we have what's required for a viable system. Now, I just wanna point out something, just reminding everyone, it is about the information. So I'm just gonna give you just, there's the arrows, the information about how the primary activities are going, the information that allows people to coordinate, the information that allows us to see is delivery happening the way we thought it would be, the monitoring, the development of things, purpose and policy. Strange thing to do, but I just use it as a way to remind us all Remember, Western world, it's so easy to think in terms of the objects and the things. And as we all know from the systems thinking world, it's the connections of the things that matter equally, or if not more. And this is what matters here in viable systems. It's about the information flow between the systems as much as it is the systems themselves. 
and then we can pop in the whole diagram back there again. Okay. So what I'd like to do now is just have a short question session just on clarifying, and then we're going to have a short go at actually applying it now. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to have a look at the chat, and then, but if anyone wants to come off mute as well and ask any clarifying questions at this point, that'd be most welcome. So we're not discussing it, we're just asking clarifying questions. So please go ahead. Um, I've just got a quick clarifying question on, hi, it's Anthony, um, on uh, system port um, yes. for development. Uh, can you just clarify what we mean? Again, yes. sorry, I was... Yeah. No, thank you, please don't apologize. It's, um, we are developing the operations so that they will be able to be valuable in a future world, not just today's world. Okay, it's about all right, building the future for keeping the system alive. That's right. the one. So if you look at that whole management box, um, the purpose of the management box is to um, allocate resources and ensure what we think is happening is happening and develop those resources or develop the operations for the future so we can handle the future and still do whatever our purpose is. That's what the management box is this for. Try to resist the urge in your mind to think of that as management of the people and look at that as management the system. Someone's got to do it. Thank you, Anthony. I appreciate those sort of questions. That's great. Mm -hmm. Now, Dave, is there anything in the chat? When I'm the one presenting, the chat doesn't... Oh, hang on, I can bring uh, it up. There's, uh, there's a fair bit of questions, Adam, in the chat. Do you want me to go through one by one from the top? No, that's okay. I think we'll jump into the exercise and, and then, then we'll come back to that. So, so I'm, this is just going to be a quick one. So what we'll do here is the opportunity to apply because the applying part, it's not difficult. You just get better and better at it. So you can have a quick listen to someone like me talking about, here's how you can hit a tennis ball. But now, okay, we've got the idea. So now what we do is we just go out in the court and start hitting them. And then we just get better and better over time. So if you think about a pressing issue that you're dealing with in your own organization or with a client of yours, what we do is we work out what the issue is, and then you simply define what is the system we're looking at. This is the one we always go straight over the top of, but are you talking about the department? Are you talking about the whole organization? Are you talking about one team? It's always important to say, what is the system? Because remember, there is always a larger viable system that your system's a part of, a, a later stage one or a higher one, and there's always a closer towards the front or a smaller one that, that's also underneath your system. So we define the system, and then we ask ourselves, where do we think the pain's coming from? Is it that we don't know what the primary activities are? Is it that they're banging into each other? Is it that we don't know whether the things are occurring the way we thought they would? Is it a lack of development towards the future? Or are we not clear on the overall purpose? If I can give you kind of the cheat code, it's coordination more than we think. It's system two. We like the idea, especially around the executive table, surely it can't be coordination. It's got to sound more impressive than that. But if you think about a lot of problems in organizations, you just got areas banging into each other and that's a coordination problem. It's not even necessarily resource allocation. But I'm just gonna go quiet for two or three minutes, define the system, look at each of the five systems and ask yourself which one there might there be an issue in, what's missing or what's being ineffective, and then see if there's a blinding flash of the obvious. See what might come out in terms of that. So I'm just gonna stay quiet for a couple of minutes. And I'm just going to go back one to the slide itself of the viable system so you can see what they are. I'll call us back in a couple of minutes.
Uh, Adam, do you want us to type it in the chat or shout it out? Or... No, it, it's okay. In, in a couple of minutes, I'll just ask people to just talk about what, what stood out to them in terms of doing the exercise. So I'll call us back in about a minute. Thirty seconds. Ten more seconds. Okay, I'm going to temporarily stop the screen sharing just so we can all be on gallery view, then I'll bring it back. I'm always interested in not necessarily what your answer was, but what stood out to you or what occurred to you or what struck you in just using viable systems model in this way to have a think through a problem. Did anything stand out to anyone that'd be useful to share with the group? So, um, I'm, I'm happy to jump in with a share, which is that I was thinking of a particular problem that I'm working on, which is strategy for an organization. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, the, the, it felt like the, primera, prim, the primary problem around strategy that I was seeking to address was actually around coordination. And uh, in a way, it's too many activities being done and yeah, lack of lack of coordination, if you like, across the operational units. But then it was also a little bit of purpose and policy. Well, purpose, yeah. So getting yeah. clear on that. And, uh, you know, there were some flow-ons into development as well. Um, mm. Yeah, interestingly enough, in the chat, uh, Bernie made the comment that, you know, development was also possibly R&D. And so yes. that sort of you know, fitted into that. So it sort of felt like, uh, yeah, look, it was an interesting frame to do some diagnosis. I'm not yet sure whether it gave me any insights. Yeah, I'm with you, Martin, I'm with you. And if we think about the idea of the information flows, because if you are doing strategy generally for an organization, you are doing that system for development. And what we're looking for is information that allows decisions made in that area to be effective. And so if you've got a bit of mess going on there, it means your information's coming at you. It's not, to use a fancy word, attenuated, which means slim down so it can make sense. And if you take information from the policy system and also from the um, management of delivery, that allows you to have information around the table that can then lead to good decisions of system four. But in a way, the engagement of you makes sense because what they're saying is our system four is, not, is feeling a bit shaky. Let's get some help on system four. They're just not using this language. Yeah, yeah. The, the other thing that came across interestingly was the whole requisite variety thing with Ashby, which is to say that, you know, uh, if you focus on less things, then, you know, you're effectively um, attenuating, in your yeah. words, you know, the, the variety in the system. That's right. But the classic attenuation is also to say we're only going to worry about one market instead of four. That way you deliberately reduce your variety to handle what you're about. So, David, what thought was in your mind? Yeah, I was thinking about um, accumulation of technical debt in systems, particularly yep. software systems. That's a common problem we run into. And I was trying to think, look at it through this lens. And at first I'm going, oh, is it we're not thinking about the future enough about the implications of it? It's like, yeah, maybe. But I was thinking about maybe where um, uh, we can't see what's actually happening. So the people that have the decisions and policies and whatever or the responsibility to make to do the um, uh, coordination and, and other things around that can't see that specifically and so there's something around that in the in the making that visible so that they, they can um, then make an active decision about is that in line with where we want to be in the future spot on so spot on. I don't, that was something that was thinking about and it'll often be approached from system for those sort of things because it feels more more interesting and more, you know, getting things done, but it's an illusion. What's often needed is some system two coordination, as you say, to get a view of what's going on. 
that then allows some system three to say, well, do we have enough resources there? And even if that's all we've got, let's at least coordinate it so we can get as much done with what we do have. So you're right. Yeah, I find when we're dealing with technical debt, the, t the trend is to go to system four development too early, maybe because executives feel comfortable there. And my work is to often help them go, your capability is actually needed to get in place some quality coordination systems here. Let's not even worry about development yet, even though your MBA says that's what you should be doing. It's not yet. So thank you, David. Okay. So in terms of a diagnostic, if you want to know how this works practically, you can do a run through of the model and then I'll just tell you what, what I do. Like gradually just created a bit of a discussion in terms of, okay, what does it look like? What sort of things exist already? And that becomes the interesting part if we start talking about what sort of things exist already. So I'll just put the, the model back up. Can anyone think of an example of a system to coordination thing that's incredibly not fancy? I know the answer, so I'm not saying it. So. Thanks, Alan. <laughs> yeah. yeah. um, th think about a university. What, what's a coordination system that exists in every university? A timetable. Spot on, David. It's a great example of the simplest coordination system. It seems so obvious we don't even notice it. Take it away. You would now have to have every day a negotiation between all the lecturers because they'd all be wanting to do the 10 or 11 a.m. one because that's convenient. Um, you'd be doing that. All the students would want it to be at a certain time. You would have to have potentially a 4,000 person negotiation every Monday or every start of first of every month to get this going. Or you could put out a timetable. So it's a great example of how the coordination system doesn't have to be fancy. And remember, before we went back to putting everything digitally, you'd print the bloody thing out and stick it on a wall. That was a coordination system. So, Aladad, something on your mind? Just a really a recent example uh, at work during Christmas, we had um, kids' Christmas party at work, right? And there were around 700 people attending that se session. You can imagine in my house, and when I get more than three kids or four, the entire house goes boom, right? So, imagine at work with that sort of environment. It went so smooth. And a big part of it was a few days before the session start, we all went in, the organizing team put people into different colors. We went in, we get a wristband, and they said, everyone with yellow at this time, go to this room, everyone with blue to this room, and then one person at the front. That was effectively both system four, which is they were looking at future, this is yep. going to happen. And system two, that was a fantastic. It went so smooth. Almost, yes. It was almost boring. We were expecting a lot of, whoa, everything is going to blow up. Nothing blew up. Everyone enjoyed it. They're good so, examples of coordination system. Yeah. Um, you see them all the time in public transport, signs up around the place and that sort of thing. And if you see a shop running that's really effective, like a really effective manufacturing shop, you'll see coordination systems everywhere. The ones that work quite well, um, visual things, something like that. Now, here's one that I could ask the question, but it's really difficult to answer. There was a coordination system that used to exist in the 80s, but because the world has got healthier, that coordination system doesn't exist like it used to. Can anyone think of what that might be? It's almost a riddle. A coordination system that existed in the 80s that no longer exists to any sort of effective degree because the world got healthier. Is that the smoking thing? You got it, Anthony. Yeah. So it was an unofficial coordination system. But if the people who could make decisions all happened to smoke, then a coordination system would be to get together and talk about the work. And of course, it's a highly exclusionary practice and blah, blah, blah. So, you know, it's, it's, not, it's not ethical. But the point is, those things are examples of one. I know of one place where they changed where the people eat, which meant that the same group wasn't eating in the same location every day. They lost a key coordination system. So if you busted out VSM to do your diagnosis, you'd say, well, how do we coordinate who's doing what and when? Someone who's just straight to the point would say, that's easy, mate. We get together at 10.30 and talk about it. But without some sort of system in place, we can't do it. And then, of course, our brains go to, we'll just put in an ERP. And, of course, that almost causes the opposite of coordination unless you get that right. So what we're looking for often, if we're detecting a lack of coordination, is the coordination system.
the classic delivery management or system three, who knows what that is, exists in almost every organization. What do you do once a year? Everyone has a thought about it. Budget. Budget, yeah. So that's the system by which it currently occurs, the resource allocation and the resource bargain. Is it effective? We could argue maybe not, but that's the classic way that it works. And performance reporting is often, again, in terms of the information coming back up. So when we're looking at that, we're actually asking the questions about how effective is that and is that occurring? But often sometimes in the places, if we don't have a way that people can see whether the restaurant's making money, there's information missing in terms of being able to manage the restaurant. Aladad. I think as you were talking, I was thinking a really fancy way of looking at it. Um, not fancy, but just another way of looking at forward. it. Is you could look at this, um, some of these systems and say, okay, let's say budgeting. is So is our system three um, going with the speed that the environment change? Nice. Simple as that. If you're doing your budgeting annually, but your environment is shifting faster, then you have a problem. So you could actually apply that lens into each of the systems as well. How often do you have to update your strategy or look up in the system? That's a really, that's a really good point. Yeah. The development work occurs during the traditional strategy day. Um, in my experience of working with clients, um, their previous experiences, they haven't really done strategy. They've done a version of delivery management because what they've discussed is these are our five pillars and they've organized the projects into their swim lanes and they've called that a strategy. Now that's not useless work. So I'm not having a go at that, but it's not actually strategy because it's not collecting information about the internal and external worlds and then using judgment and intuition to make some decisions. But if you think about the case of a senior manager or a manager within a classic organization, they're also making development decisions. If we don't get training in this area, we're not going to be able to do the job next year. We're going to need to learn how to sell that new product. That's examples of development work that occurs you know, at that lower level of recursion. So any given system, and for yourselves, it's, I want to do a big bike ride next year, might cross your mind. I better start doing some training. That'd be an example of some development work for your human system. And maybe your bigger purpose is because I want to live a more active life. So, so that's how all those sort of systems can come together. And by engaging a group in a discussion, and my preferred way of doing consulting is present the idea or the concept and then join with them in discussing it. I, and mainly because I, I hate writing reports. <laughs> I actively don't like it. I would pay someone to do it rather than get paid myself. And I find it more effective just to talk about the model than get them to work through it. So that's the idea of a diagnosis. And naturally, whenever you're doing a diagnosis, you can move it in the other direction by saying, well, if we are designing how this works, what are our systems of coordination going to be? How are we going to allocate the resources? So we can list out each of the headings and we can simply say, how are we going to do that? So that's how it works as both a diagnostic in terms of what's not going right, and then a future looking thing in terms of how can we design so it can go right in the future. Now, I just want to carry off the, um, just the point that often pops up about hierarchy. Um, now, hierarchy is not automatically bad. A dominant hierarchy can be. This is actually from um, one of the books. And Stafford Beer says, the production controller does not have higher status than the system one manages. They have more knowledge about what is happening in the rest of the organization. In other words, they have the vantage point to see across the show, but it doesn't mean they're a higher class of person. While it's true that knowledge is power, in this case, as in any other, the production controller's power is limited to anti-oscillatory regulation. In other words, the production controller exists to stop things swinging from here, back to here, back to here. It's the equivalent to stopping the goods going in a lift up to this floor, not our floor, go and gather lift to that floor, not our floor, going back up again. Production controller is there to play the coordinating role, but they don't have to be a high class of human. So the idea is a presentation, as Stafford Beer says, is of say system two in this example, shouldn't be threatening, but it often is because the role is unclear and people start saying, I'm the one that's going to tell you what to do. But that doesn't come from system two. That's agreed as system three. So that's one of the important things about hierarchy in terms of the viable system model. Nowhere in the model does it say, this is the group of people that must do this, or this is a separate group of people. But naturally, organizations are going to organize themselves in a certain way. So I'd always like to point out that's a human organizational thing it's not the viable system model necessarily. I'll come back to that shortly because another thing I wanna point out is this idea. If we look at a shopping center, do we say it's a hierarchical arrangement? Because you do have a shopping center, which is a viable system. Then within that shopping center, we have a series of shops. Each one of them is a viable system. 
So what's more important, the shopping center or the shops? And I think the answer is trick question because the shopping center is only as viable as the shops in it and the shops in it are only as viable as the shopping center. So they have a synergistic relationship and we could argue it's hierarchical because one provides the containing environment for the other, but not hierarchical in the usual way we see it. So I always like to point this out when we're talking about models where you do have recursions or levels to remember that these sort of hierarchies exist, but it's a choice about whether we see them as enabling and containing versus seeing them as dominant and power over. And just a couple of examples where viable systems, Martin, I'll come back to you in just a tick. And just a couple of examples where viable system models being used, because it's used by co-ops, because they deliberately want to actually set up a situation where they can have the necessary controls without it having to have bosses. And so one example is Suma, which has been around not quite as long as I have, but nearly. And what they are is um, they're a Whole Foods co-op and they deliberately used the viable system model because the reason a co-op brings this in is it all starts great, then you get a bit big and what do you know, love alone is not working anymore, but we don't want to bring in traditional, um, what you would call traditional hierarchy. So the viable system model pops up. And this is where I like to use an expression that, that I came across years ago. It's about rooms and not roles. So what I mean by that is you don't necessarily have to have system three delivery management person, but you need to have a system three delivery management metaphorical room. So when it's time to get together to say, how are we doing in terms of delivery management? Right, maybe exactly the same group of people that do the, the primary activities then get in the room and say, right, let's look at our data. Let's look at our information. Let's talk about which resources are going where. So then we have that room. And then strangely, those exact same people can come out of that room and start packing boxes. And so that's where I like to use the expression rooms and not roles to remind us that it's a choice that we make, whether we say that person is the one that does the system three or system four work versus saying that is a system four decision, let's get that group in to make that call. And of course, I think most hierarchies can improve by having a bit of both where you might have someone whose job it is to make that call, maybe called a general manager on behalf of the whole organization, but to go about it in a way that says, tell me what you're seeing. And just another example is Mondragon, started off in Spain, um, initially in, um, in agricultural areas, but now in finance and industry and the like. And they've been able to use viable system model as well in various aspects to, again, maintain exactly the same principles of we have sufficient autonomy at the source so people can be themselves and do their thing. But we have the systems in place that in turn allow us to stay viable as a whole in the wider environment. And I'd just like to leave this one in your mind before we all have a chat about it, which is, you could say, this is a hypothesis I have, could never prove it. Maybe hierarchy comes from the very human need to be okay in an uncertain world. We're okay by get those with power to protect us. We kind of like the dominant boss in a weird way because it's not my problem. And also by controlling what we can to make it certain, which means if I can be that sort of boss, I can relax because I know people will do what I say. So ironically, us humans create the perfect conditions for dominant dependent hierarchies. Maybe we secretly like it that way, which is why any model such as a viable system model can be bent into a hierarchical shape pretty quickly. But as those examples of Mondragon and Sumer and many others show, that's a choice that we can make as people. If you want a couple of sources, the Fractal Organization, my colleague and friend, Patrick Hoverstadt, he's there, he's there in the UK, he lives, um, halfway between Manchester and Leeds. I can't remember the name of the place exactly. He's written the most accessible book um, on the viable system model. I really like it. And that one on the right, you see, that was actually got some examples of those ones that I spoke about. And what's great about the case studies, it didn't work right. It's a real world thing. But he went and wrote for cooperatives, here's how to use the VSM for that. So there are a couple of sources, but I recommend starting with the Fractal Organization if you're interested in it, because Patrick's just, uh, his writing's excellent. So that's my bit in terms of sort of being able to go through my stuff. So now we get to the part where we get to all have a little bit of a chat about it. Adam, that, that was fascinating, of course. Um, one of the best talks I've ever seen about oh, this. Thank you. Um, really, really appreciate it. Um, I, um, in your example, where you said you have a general manager who's taking care of a, a broad group, um, are you, I mean, when you mention that um, maybe we like hierarchy because it gives us a bit of a certainty, mm. I think the opposite example of that is the, what you provided in the, you have a room. Um, 
instead of seeing a hierarchy as a person, we see it as a mechanism. Yep. And also, uh, one thing that is I will cautious everyone, that's one of my big bear, um, bugbear with a lot of, even some of the agile methodologies, is a general manager will never have the requisite variety of everyone in that team, her or him or it, right? So, or they. So, um, so uh, that is why uh, I think... Um, these new models, uh, the models where you tap into the collective, um, so you provide mechanism, so we can tap into the collective consciousness of a group for managing themselves, rather than relying on a single person, a single person, regardless how great they are, even if you're Gandhi or whatever, uh, you cannot have the requisite variety that the entire people that follows you or report to you have. Uh, there's another example, just psychologist um, uh, called Bo Lotto. He talked about a space of possibility. Yes, people, the space of possibility is very different. The general manager see teams different, but collectively, when you put together a space of possibility of group of people, that suddenly expanded significantly. Mm -hmm. Problem is, up until now, it was hard to make those sort of decisions. Now, with technology, with uh, with, with experiment with a lot of different organizational parts, we do not need traditional hierarchies anymore. It's very rare that there is a need for traditional hierarchy. That's my hypothesis, obviously. And, and, what, and what you'll get from the viable systems model is the idea of saying, whatever you call it, you're going to need some sort of system three that's actually looking at the allocation of resources and are we getting what we expected. The thing we can now see is um, open to us is let's figure out the best way for us to do that, given this group of people in our circumstances. And I think that's the power of VSM, which is why it's popped up a bit these days, is to be able to say, no, we still need that system, but it's optional how we go about doing it. So, yeah, thanks, Eladad. What else come to mind? Ma Martin, I saw you had some comments in the uh, in the chat as well as you were going to yeah, mention something. I have a, actually a very simple question, Adam, which is uh, I love your example of the shopping centre and the shops. So how would you represent that in VSM? You know, why, how would you sort of, let's say, create the dependencies? Yep, I would set it up that um, if I had to draw it on a diagram, you would have each shop as a primary activity of the shopping centre. Yeah. And then within each shop, each shop would be its own VSM as well. But the wider containing system of the shops is that. And then I'd look at each one of those systems. And the linkages of information is, the coordination between the shops. And I'm sure shopping centers have some various forums and ways that they actually make sure that everyone's happy. And um, and if you're talking about allocating resources in a shopping center, I'm guessing that's, we're gonna look after that section before that section and that sort of thing. What BSM tells us is if the information's not flowing and we're not making those decisions, as Aladad said, at the right um, speed of the loop, we cannot be as viable. So that, that's how that would come about. Thanks. By the way, I, actually, I just want to say, great presentation. Really loved it. Um, Thank you. You know, it uh, it brought VSM to life for me. Thanks. Oh, I appreciate that. Thank you. I can look through some of the questions just while we're all having a bit of ponder. Um, Martin, how does the VSM deal with uncertainty? Um, the idea is it's set up to deal with uncertainty. And the, the important thing, as Aladad said, is that we're going through the loops quickly enough. Um, it deals with the uncertainty of primary activities by providing autonomy to the front so that they can respond to the things that's occurring to them. But hopefully we've got enough in place that they can't respond to the degree that it disintegrates the rest of the system. And then we have system four in place to consider how does your operation work in terms of that. So it's designed to live in an environment that is not certain through making sure we have all the systems in place that we can make decisions to be able to handle that. So David, what's on your mind? Uh, was the clarification on resource bargains. Yes. It was something, and I was, I was just more curious, like I, I was trying to turn that into something concrete for myself. Yeah, what sure. What are some common sure. examples or your explanation of that? Yeah. So the resource bargain works well when you're talking to a group of mates and you're saying, do you reckon you could take care of that for me? Um, how much time would you need to do it? And that sort of thing. We go into the world of work and we get weird about it, um, where people get you know, this is going to be your budget and you have to fight to try to get it in the other direction and all that sort of stuff. So there are examples of the resource bargain attempting to happen. 
And so that's what it looks like concrete. So that's why the example is often budget time. But as we know, budget's that bit where first you go argue with the CFO, then you go argue with the CEO and all that sort of thing. But that's what you'd point out using BSM is you'd say, so that's how your system three is working. That's your method. Do you think that's the way to actually optimize the resource allocation of this organization? And that can lead to some of those discussions. So that's what the resource bargain is. And look at it from the point of view of we want to create autonomy as much as we can with the primary activities within the bounds of not upsetting the whole. And so by agreeing the resource bargain, which is in return for this budget, you will provide this stuff to that group of customers. We can now set up the conditions for them to have autonomy. And if you look at it, the opposite of a hierarchy, a group of six people working out their own partnership, each one of them might say, here's what I'll contribute with this budget. And everyone says, that sounds good to me. That'd be an example of a system three resource bargain occurring. Mm. Yeah, it piqued my interest because um, often called capacity planning or something similar and, and just seeing the dysfunction around that and the results. Yeah, um, so that might be coordination uh -huh. sometimes. If you're capacity planning according to what's the best way to optimise what we've got, that's going to be coordination. If it's the decisions about here's how much we're going to give you and this is what we'd like back, let's talk about that, that then becomes system three. And again, okay. the point is to have those conversations and later on we can say, did we cover system two or system three? That's always the trick with all this stuff, as in if the stuff's happening, who cares whether they're using the words or not? Yeah, yeah. thank you. System two and three are the big ones in organisations. System four, generally not as effective as it should be, but system two and three would eliminate so much pain if it was taken seriously. Or oh, sorry, if it was applied more seriously. So. Uh, sorry, just jumping there uh, quickly. Dave, your example of capacity planning, uh, I'm facing a situation where the organisation system four is not working well, as well as system two. They always are facing a problem with a number of people working on projects and then always last minute they say oh i need this additional skill set i need this additional people i need this additional so the, the thing is the um, communication lines between different systems is not working well because the operation is going doing things and they're busy with today and now System four is not looking at the new the, the new projects that are coming through. System three is not looking at allocating the right capacity to the right project. So none of those systems are working well. And if they're working well, the connection between them are not working well. So sometimes it is not a single system that is dysfunctional. Sometimes it's just a combination of them. Um, another quick example is they were saying in one organization, they got rid of PMO when they went agile. And then everyone just got quite confused. They didn't know where to go. They didn't know where to find people. Uh, a lot of the time, agile folks like myself, we said, oh, PM, we don't need PMO, it's all about control. But if you're removing a coordination or a bargaining function from an organization, you need to have a replacement for it. If your model is very command and control, yes, we can replace it with some self-managing uh, models, but you still need that system. So. That was another example. That's such a, that's such a good point, Alad, that, yeah. yeah. Program office and swapping to that version of Agile you're talking about, yeah, that's replacing one type of system to coordination for another. It seems a bigger deal because program officers often can sit up quite high because they're overseeing a lot. That doesn't mean, though, and does it, it, it doesn't mean just because it's a system two function that it's not important. That's our old school hierarchy stuff in our head telling us that. I saw the reference to flight levels, like to Klaus and um, Cliff Hazel's work. So the flight levels does... Um, does respond it's another way to put um the systems if you talk about a whole organization um elliot jack's requisite organization Gillian stamp work is another good example when if you apply bsm to a whole organization you'll start to see a connection between there so you've kind of got i like the idea of you've got these brilliant thinkers they're all climbing up the same hill they're just kind of climbing up using different faces of the same hill so which is why I don't get caught up in debates about which one's right. I tend to think, well, which song do we need? I mean, some clients I'll bust out a bit of old school RO to help yeah. them see what the different roles are. Other clients need a bit of BSM. And, and I love the lingo of flight levels. It's a, it's a nice way to say there are different types of work, but it seems to be nicer for people. So, yeah, it's all the same stuff. It has it's to be the same. It's right? popping up everywhere. <laughs> it, well, it has to be the same. It's the same natural yeah. world. Like, it exactly. can't be different. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, the, the the Gemba or Gemba walk, um, yeah, it can be a type of ad hoc monitoring. Um, 
it can also be used as a way for a variety of systems. So you can do a, that type of work as a system five thing to say, is the stuff I'm seeing reflecting the purpose? Then you could ask yourself, why isn't it? And you can go any of the given systems you can do for a, for a gimbal walk to answer that question. So why they labeled systems? Because it was written in the seventies. That's the answer to that question. Um, how, what else can I help with? Yeah, R and D can apply to the variety of systems. So R and D, where you're looking into future type things, and if you're going to run some of the, you know, the cleric Jeff, Jeffrey Moore zone to win stuff, where you're doing some experiments and that sort of thing, they might be done for the purpose of informing system four. But each one of those experiments is its own little viable system. It's going to have primary activities, needs to be coordinated, and the rest of it. So that's how that can come together. But you might be doing R&D for system three to think if we rearrange this whole show, would it work a lot better? So look at R&D as actually um, being a contributor of information into various systems. And here's one that might be kind of interesting thing to rattle around in your mind. Any functions such as accounting, um, any of the ones that support the business, like to use the old Michael Porter value chain, any of those support activities, they can't be system one. They might have their own viable system in the sense of once you're in that system, they've got their system on outputs, here's the monthly financials. But in terms of the whole organization, they cannot be system one because unless you're an accounting organization, no organization exists for its finance department. But that doesn't mean it's not a crucial input of information, particularly into system three. So remember that it's a useful way to remind people both, we're not here for your area, but then in the very next sentence say, but we're completely stuffed without your area. So it can be quite valuable to help that out. Okay. I think it all makes sense looking at the comments. Hospital triage is a great example of system two coordination. Okay, the company still do budgets, hell yeah. Yeah, so your point, the shopping, the shop needs a shopping center, the shopping center needs the shop. Yeah. Yeah, thanks, Aras, for that point. Are you still here? Just for that point about the uh, the Chile thing. Yeah, there's quite a diff few different angles on that. So. Oh, well, that seems to be the main sort of comments. Okay. Um, the point about strategy is more about intuition. I'll just put into there, if we're talking about the system four work for the whole show, by definition, it has to be somewhere because there's no data about the future. So at some point, there has to be judgment applied in terms of strategy. Then you can do, I like Roger Martin's point of view where he says, what would need to be true? It's a fancy way to say assumptions. What would need to be true for that strategy to not be a dumb idea? Um, but even then, you, you can put all that out. I, I work with strategy clients on a little matrix which says, how much are we relying on that factor and how certain are we? And if there's something we're totally relying on and we're totally uncertain about it, we might get a bit worried about that strategic option. But in the end, that's as close as we're going to get. The data we're going to collect is probably not going to push us one way or the other. So, so I think strategy is about intuition. Um, one of my favourite football coaches, that's um, Aussie Rules Football here in Australia, his name was Lee Matthews, and he said, you fill your head with as much information as you can and then you let your gut make the decision. And I really like that idea because you're not being lazy. You're being rigorous about collecting information that's useful. But in the end, you're acknowledging there is no data about the future. We're just making that decision. So that's what I think the good system for work comes from. Cool. Adam, I have a, I have one for you. Um, early days for me when I started, when I learned about VSM, I, I look at it and I say, okay, where is HR? Where is marketing? Yes. Where is uh, finance? Where is um, operation team? O operation team means system one. So how would you respond to that for someone who's starting? Yeah. So we say, what do you do? How does it contribute? So let, let's say marketing. Marketing is, you could say it's it connected to the primary activity because it makes people aware that that's what you do. But marketing is also a system four activity in terms of its role in providing information into strategy and the like. like. My simple way of looking at it is strategy is about positioning in the ecosystem and marketing is about the value exchange that works when we're at that position. It's just my simple way to, but they naturally inform each other a lot. So if you take something like marketing, that's where it's going to sit. 
in system one, um, information into system one to drive demand and system four in order to do that. And naturally it'll have a say in system three to say, hey, give me a bit more money and this is what I can do. So it's a pretty good example, that one. I think the classic one is if you take anything like business improvement, um, they're gonna float around in system two and system three. System two is where they can actually add the most value. Theory of constraints is a brilliant example of system two done amazingly. Like gold rats work is system two genius all the way. And it shouldn't ever be thought of as therefore closer to the front line. It's, it's actually genius. It's how to coordinate everything. So um, yeah, so that's where that sort of thing comes in. And of course, finance provides, it's all about those arrows. It provides the information flow that allows all those decisions to occur around the place. So yeah. Beautiful, it's beautifully said, thank you. Yeah. So that's an, over, that's an overview of, um, of VSM. Um, I enjoy questions, everyone. So if you want to email me anything, you're not bothering me. You're actually making my day more interesting. So um, yeah, it's an open invitation to email me with, with any questions. And I, I like talking about this stuff. So if I can even help by appearing somewhere and doing a quick half hour talk, I'm always more than happy to help out the community. So honestly, I, I really find this stuff interesting and I'm curious. So please reach out if there's anything I can do to help. I think Carl had a right. question there. Was that a question, Carl? There, so Martin. Yeah, yes. so the first Martin. name, by, by the way, is Martin. Huh? <clears throat> uh, hey, Martin. Yeah. So if we uh, look on organization, I think you have this uh, three columns. So the anatomy, how the organization is structured. So the org chart. Uh, you have the uh, physiology, so the processes, and you have the neurology, so the communication channels. Nice. My point of view is that VSM is really focusing on this uh, neurology, so the communication information flow. Nevertheless, you need somehow some processes and some clarity on the organizational structure. So any ideas how you transform this knowledge from the VSM into the other columns? What yeah, yeah. tips do you have? Yeah, definitely, Martin. Um, you're picking up that it's more about neurology than the um than the anatomy. That's um that's really insightful because it is about that information flow and making sure the right information gets to the people that make the decisions. So, what VSM says is for all of those things, it's almost a version of shrug whatever you need to make sure that those systems are getting good information to make those calls. So the org structure is one way that we can look at that. If you've got a role called senior manager and there's just the one of them and you say your job's to do system three and that person is good at it and takes information but that might be how you say that's how we handle system three so that'd be a combination of structure hopefully the neurology um to be able to get in the information but there's different ways that you can do it a collective will have a group of people meeting in a room to talk about that so if you want to take any of the three you mentioned the neurology part is actually the most important and you just have the the anatomy or the structure part to enable the information flow so the work happens. So, so that's why VSM, you could, I don't know whether you'd call it a meta theory, but it kind of sits outside of, like if you take something like records of organization that says these are your levels of work and here's how you line them up, VSM would say, yeah, that might work. And there might be another way to do it. Whereas Elliot Jacks would rise from the dead and say, there is only one way to do it. Yeah, whereas VSM tends to be a bit more like, as long as you're covering that stuff, your system's probably going to be viable, assuming you're making enough money. Does that sort of help at all, Martin? Yep, thank oh, you. I like, the, I like that, the neurology of it. Cool, yeah. <laughs> David. Yeah, um, the risk of dominating the questions. Apologies oh. to the rest of the group. Um, but uh, this is more of a curious question you, you mentioned around, you, you don't mind uh, discussing this stuff, but I was starting to think about what's on your learning edge when you think about all this great stuff that you know, you apply and you seem, you know, able to spit out quite quickly yeah. and easily. If you to think about what's challenging, not only this, but anything really for you personally yeah. around what 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 are you trying to absorb right now or, yeah, or oh, challenge yourself to think differently around? There is a book I'm reading. Let me just grab the name of it. Um, she's worked in systems for years. I um, can't believe I can't remember her name. It's embarrassing. Oh, Alicia, um, Alicia Guerrero. I don't know if it's a name people know about. Um, she works in a small university. I think it's in Maryland um, in America. She's a genius, right? Because it's a teaching university, 
So she gets to research whatever she wants. There's no obligation. That's why she chose that university. So she can look at whatever the hell she wants without any sort of obligations. She looks at systems theory, but in particular constraints. And what she works on is the thinking about, it's not just cause and effect that explains the world. It's the idea of the way constraints sit in systems and that affects the behaviors, which in turn creates the system. And the one of the classic metaphors she uses is a roundabout. You drop a roundabout into a road as compared to traffic lights, that's an example of a constraint, but don't think a constraint as in constricting people, a constraint as in it constructs things, and that's going to cause certain behaviours of the way people drive, which in turn creates a system by which people drive, but that becomes the culture of it. So that's an example where I find her work fascinating because it almost feels like it's going beneath the surface again to say, this is how this stuff works. And the idea of dropping in constructive constraints, like if you think about a river and you put a rock in it, that causes things to change. Sometimes I think that's what we're doing in terms of both running organizations or even running our lives. We're trying to put stuff in to make the natural flow of stuff go in a direction that's more suitable. So yes, that, that's where mine's going at the moment, where my mind is, just to read that and sort of see what pops up. Uh, I'm just curious how that relates to, you know, Snowden's work around enabling constraints and other things and same thing. Yes. Uh, that he talks about. Same thing, yeah. Um, Dave comes along with his incredibly bright and intelligent, <laughs> I, I call him a, um, a historical name dropper because he'll say, yeah, we're applying the Aristotle idea that Socrates did. He's like, he drops all these names <laughs> so quickly that you can't really tell whether, um, yeah, he's looked at it or not. So I, I respect his mind and the way he puts that together. And Alicia's work talks about constraints in a similar way. Um, I just find her work to be, um, I almost feel like it's more general and applicable. So, but Dave, you work on estuarine mapping. I can see the patterns you're seeing in that and that makes a bit of sense. So yeah, that type of thing. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Dave, you know, there's a great debate on LinkedIn between Patrick, who's my mate and, and Dave. And Dave basically says you can't have a model because the model, you're, it's basically acting like the world's mechanical. And the answer to that would be, we're just applying the model to come up with some ideas. Then we can try some stuff and see if it works. Because in the end, it's just a model. So yep. it doesn't explain reality in the end at all. So, yeah, it's an interesting time, isn't it? Got brains like Dave Snowden getting around and this sort of stuff. And um, it's quite an interesting time, really. Yeah, thanks. Um, actually, as Dave Snowden talk a lot about Alicia, um, he, he keep referring Alicia's work about constraints. There you go. Yeah. Yeah, no, Alicia just, uh, her writing's heavy, but if you're a bit of a geek for this stuff like me, I kind of like that. I'm going to read that paragraph another two times and absorb it. So, yeah, that, that that's what I find with that. But, of course, the fun is then making it useful for clients, isn't it? Like to be able to say, so what this means is, let's try that. Cool. Awesome. Oh, any more questions coming through? No. I've actually lost my, 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 oh, there it is. Okay, cool. Thanks for your comment, Rick. So I, I saw that. The droster. Yep. <laughs> I like that. That's my, my favorite. My Dutch heritage. My Dutch heritage. Yeah. <laughs> my, favorite right Dutch word is, yeah. my favorite Dutch word is canal, Rick. Canal? The, uh, okay, yeah. Ah, uh, plucked. The canal. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You got to say the G sound and the CH sound in the one word. That's brilliant. Yeah, it's the same sound. It's the same sound. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Adam, um, and also Ali and Dave for hosting. Very, very insightful. I'm very glad I joined. So thanks for Joanne Lurie for putting me onto this. She suggested this. Um, this meet up to me, so thanks. Cool, oh, a pleasure. Yeah. It's, it's definitely a pleasure. I mean, Joan's, uh, Joan's one of our speaker alumni. Uh, I see Joan's joined us as well. So, hi, Joan. Oh, hi, Joan. <laughs> Just for those who might not have seen it, Aladad put a comment up in, um, in the comments, Alicia talking about constraints. I haven't seen that video, but um, yeah, just an idea of, to, Alicia's stuff's just great, so. Um, yeah, it's really worth a look. Okay. 
Maybe one more question. I'm going to encourage. I'm going to encourage one more question. See if anybody's got. The, what's, somebody's got some, something on the tip of their tongue. They're dying. dying. See, Bernie looks like she's leaning forward. Maybe I'm not sure. Well, she might just be watching the TV. I'm not sure. <laughs> one more no, question. no, no, no. I was just curious what is next because I actually have to leave very soon. But um, I did pop the question uh, earlier about the merger. If anyone had experience doing a merger, because I was trying to figure it out what what is broken. <laughs> In the, if it is still viable even because I, I, it looks like my company um, or oh, the company that I'm working for um, I'm not too sure if it's going to be viable anymore but definitely not in the way that it is right now yeah so so what, what what's normally occurring there is um, you've got the system threes that are pulling against each other so yeah exactly but you're trying to make an actual viable system to yeah. start with and the difficulty is it's an arbitrary point in a given system, what you define as the system. You could just make it yourself. You could make it the whole world. Um, yeah. So without realizing it, people are just using normal words, but they're having a battle for what is the system itself. That's yeah. that's what's occurring. So it's, it, it can be tricky, but if a group can see that's what's going on, sometimes it can change the conversation, which can then lead them to hopefully a blinding flash of the obvious. But often I think that's the use of this sort of stuff is if they can approach it from a different angle, which is, you're all seeing this thing, but this is what you're seeing. That can perhaps pull them out of the idea of, well, I want to wear a red t-shirt. Well, I want to wear a blue one. Red's better, blue's better, you know, which is kind of where it in, tends to end up. And um, Benny, yes. um, one point is also about system five. Quite often what I realize when the co companies join, they have very different identity, ethos, culture. Very, very little. And and uh, and also look the way they, they used to work together, the way they, the things they pay attention to, this, yeah. the way they see their identity is very different. Very little yeah. work is usually done during those measures. They usually look at how do we manage the IT system so we get some efficiencies, etc. Yeah. Um, yeah. A really good way to address that is run a search conference, help the different group to come together for a more des collective desirable future. Right. That's a good so point. Search yeah. conference from OSC is one of the really, really good ways post mergers and acquisitions. Yeah. Hey, Alida, that's a really good point. In in a way, it's a system five yeah. battle. Yeah. Yeah. Could be system five. Yes. Yeah. I think it's both in, the, in my case because I'm like recognizing obviously a, a, a while it was yeah, system three. I already had recognized, but you have a point on system five. Thanks for that. It's definitely there because one of the discussions right now. It's about um, if we are gonna exist in the way, so that's the question, right? Are we gonna exist in the way that we previously existed, which is a purpose, which is system five? Yeah, and actually what one thing I didn't mention on the way through is um, um, Stafford B would draw a link between system five and system one to say, you could say what you're doing and all that sort of stuff, but but what are you actually providing to the world? Yeah. And then when that circles has integrity, yeah. it works yeah, out well. Yeah, yeah that's true. Okay. Thanks for that. My experience, my experience with the merger, it's also both systems sort of need to end for a new one to appear. And that's hard. As you have the loss of the ending yeah. of both the separate systems and the new one. Yeah. So you have the fighting, of course, because I don't want to die. Yeah. 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 Well, in our case, I don't think I don't think ours is gonna survive because we're much smaller. <laughs> It's essentially a very big old corporation buying a startup, right? So yeah, yeah. it's kind of like ended, really. And that's what I'm thinking. But definitely the five is what's coming up now. And I don't think we will survive based on that, based on money, size, you know, and all of the resources that it's on, yeah. on the one that acquired the startup, right? And it's such a good point that Rick's made. Yeah, because you're talking about the de a death here. It's a death of identity, which needs to be yeah. worked through. Yeah. yeah, it is. And hence what you said about system five, yeah, the purpose yeah. is almost close to your identity. Yeah. 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 The problem is in the past, uh, someone at the top tried to impose a new identity. And depending on from which side they come from, they try to impose that identity as opposed to, okay, now we are a new organization. Let's come together and agree on what our new identity should look like. What is that more desirable future for all of us look like and then walk back forth from that so mm -hmm. anyway let's uh... mm. so just to add to that uh i love that topic too in um in orsk language for those that are familiar mm -hmm. with uh, that you know there's a thing mm -hmm. called lands work where you can get people to understand their cultures and 
understand mm. what's good and bad about them and then talk about what do you want to actually create together and so mm. that's just working on the relationship only not the the structural elements but just the yeah. relationship side which probably is closely linked to purpose and identity as well because of of that but it it, it looks at just that particular aspect the relationship between people mm. very nice yeah. Yeah, nice. Well, thanks for that, Adam. Brilliant. Thank you. Oh, Thank pleasure. You. I'm fortunate to leave because I have a meeting open right in front of Westbrook. <laughs> it's <laughs> 9 30 here. And, <laughs> and Joan, that. Joan to, give you a very, to give you a very quick answer, Joan, often system two coordination, rules of engagement, implicit contracts, keeps things all, keeps things coordinated. So, but it could be any of them, but mainly system two is where we find those sort of things. Okay. Okay. Thank you so much, Adam. It's uh, seven thirty here in Sydney. Um, one and a half hour. Thank you, everyone, for uh, staying this long. And thanks, Adam. Those was fascinating. Like I said, one of the best uh, VSM talks I've ever heard. Um, and and thanks also to the participants. You really, really good questions and yeah. um and very relevant. So I learned equally from the questions and from the answer. So I appreciate that. My favorite bit, the questions. Cool. Cool. All right, well, maybe with that, we, we say thank you everybody for coming tonight, particularly Adam, uh, and sharing your, your brilliant mind with us and doing it in a way that actually, um, I think uh, made it easy for people to really get um, into the world of VSM. So maybe a virtual clap for, for Adam, please, or if you can come off mute and clap, that's fine as well. Um, thank, thank you very you, much. Really and, appreciate uh, it. Cool. Um, <laughs> we'll get the video up as soon as uh, Ali, Dad, myself, and Mahal can um, uh, get muster the strength to do the the editing and put it up there. And uh, we'll let everybody in the group know when that's done too. So thank you again, Adam, and everybody who's joined us. Pleasure. Thank you. Thank you.